I'm going to try to explain quantum mechanics today without philosophy and without maths. I'm going to assume you've never seen a differential equation before and don't necessarily have any maths background, but still would like to understand the basics of quantum mechanics without going through the philosophy which normally makes it more complicated than it is. I'm going to, I am going to present equations, but whenever I present an equation, I'm going to present a simulation of this equation so that you can intuitively understand what the equation is doing without working through the maths yourself. Let's start. This is an equation that describes how waves move in deep, calm water. With high school equations, the equation normally says what something is, but this type of equation tells us how something moves. So far, all I'm trying to explain is that we have an equation, and it tells us how the water moves. There is an equation on the left, and on the right we have a particular type of movement. If this seems complicated, you're perhaps overthinking it. Let's pick another very similar, but also quite simple example. Let's look at this equation. This is the Schrodinger equation. It's very similar to the deep water wave equation, and it also tells us how a curve moves. Again, so far this is quite simple. I've shown you an equation, and all it means is that it tells us how a particular curve moves. I'm not going to explain how to solve this equation here, and I'm not expecting you to understand the equation by itself, only that we have an equation on the left, and it tells us how a curve moves on the right. Once more, if this seems complicated, you're probably overthinking it. This Schrodinger equation is the starting point for quantum mechanics. It tells us how a single electron by itself moves in one direction. The next step is to talk about what this curve means. Here is the same Schrodinger equation solved, but displayed slightly differently. The x-axis here is position, and the y-axis is the probability of the electron being at that position. If we pause the video here, we can see peaks in the curve. These are the places the electron is most likely to be at, but it could be almost anywhere. This can be confusing, but if you just allow yourself to accept the simplicity of this all, it's not that complicated. We just have an equation, the equation tells us how the curve moves, and that curve is the probability of the electron being in a certain place at a certain time. And that's it, that is the idea behind quantum mechanics. Unlike with water though, there's no underlying mechanism that we know about that makes it do this, it's just a brute fact that that is how electrons move. Let's move to two dimensions. We'll take the same equation and add one more dimension. This is still the Schrodinger equation, but this time a single free electron moving in two dimensions instead of one. It, can, it looks like this. If we pause the video at a certain point, the lighter colours are where the electron is more likely to be, and the darker colours are where the electron is less likely to be. This is the quantum analogy of an electron bouncing around a two-dimensional box forever. Next, let's look at a famous experiment, the double slit experiment. We have an electron which starts off in the left, moving to the right. It hits a wall with two holes in, in the wall. Some of the wave goes through the wall, through the holes, representing some probability of the electron getting through the wall. On the other side, we see an interference pattern, where it's alternating between uh, light and dark, or high and low electron prob probability. When we do this in real life, even with one electron at a time, we also see an interference pattern, which is a very strong indication that that is how electrons really move, they really do travel as waves. It would be very hard to explain this pattern without assuming that the electron is a wave. The next step is to add a nucleus to the picture. In the real world, most electrons are in atoms. Atoms have a nucleus and an electron. We can add the nucleus, or at least the electric field of the nucleus, by adding something to the Schrodinger equation. Let's see what happens to the electron. We start with the electron at the far left, but initially moving to the right. It's going to hit a proton fixed in the centre of the screen and scatter off it. You might be wondering if it's going to turn into an atom. Electron plus proton equals hydrogen atom. The answer is mostly no. This is because the electron is going too fast. Let's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit and start with a slower electron starting already deep in the nucleus's energy well. And we get the following. This time, the electron stays around and we have an atom. The electron is moving around the nucleus, but still very excited. Just to see what happens, 
let's try hitting this with a short pulsed electric field. As you can see, the electron gets dragged around. On the right hand side of this screen, I've zoomed out a lot and you can see the electric field that this movement would cause. It oscillates, and the way it oscillates has several definite frequencies to it. Remember that this is the light coming off um, a hydrogen atom that has been hit by a short pulse. These frequencies can be compared to a real atom, and if you do this calculation again in three dimensions, the frequencies of a real hydrogen atom and the results of, of a simulation like this match perfectly, and likewise for more complicated atoms too. That takes us to the next main milestone, the electron atoms. But first, let's summarise what we've covered so far. We have a simple equation on the left-hand side. We've got a simple behaviour on the right-hand side. The curve shows where an electron is likely to be, and the way that this behaves matches experiment perfectly. So, the two electron atom. You might imagine that we just have two different wave functions. One wave function for the first electron, and one wave function for the second electron. They just follow the Schrodinger equation and all's good. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Instead, we have just one wave function, but it has twice as many dimensions. This is probably the first complicated idea presented so far. Let's go back to one dimensional wire with two electrons on the wire. Just to be clear, this is the classical picture, not the quantum mechanical picture. The first electron has a position x1, the second electron has position x2. If we want to make a simulation of both electrons, we have two x's, and so really a simulation with two variables. We can instead plot the x1 on the x-axis and x2 on the y-axis, so we might have a starting point like this. Just to reiterate, the x-axis is the position of the first electron, and the y-axis is the position of the second electron. Just let's have a checkpoint here. Make sure that you understand the classical and non-quantum thing. The only confusing thing here is the way that we've plotted it. The second electron's position is on the y-axis, and the first electron is on the x-axis. Ask yourself, why does the ball appear to stay in the top left half? And if that's not clear, pause the video, maybe watch this part of it again, and work it out. Remember that this is not quantum mechanics, this is just two classical balls on a wire. Now we can write a Schrodinger equation for this situation too, and it looks like this. This equation, as before, tells us how the two electrons move, like this. Watch this a few times until you understand it. Make sure, try to make sure you understand why the wave function stays in the top left corner. The reason, as for the classical situation, is that the two electrons can't easily pass by each other, because they repel each other. This is a one-dimensional system, so for an electron, for the pair of electrons to end up in the bottom right corner, one of the electrons would need to squeeze past the other. And although that isn't uh, impossible in quantum mechanics, it's very unlikely, which is why the electron tends to stay in the top left corner. So let's take another checkpoint. We've got the Schrodinger equation. It tells us how particles move. If we have two electrons, we just write down a wave equation with twice as many dimensions, and the Schrodinger equation with minor modification works just fine. If you've absorbed all three of the points above, then congratulations, this is quantum mechanics. Now though, we're going to look at exchange symmetry. There's one glaring problem with the picture above, which will make any physicist watching this squirm with discomfort. In the real world, the wave functions for two electrons never ever looks like this. It always looks like this. The reason is that the universe seems to have a weird symmetry about it. If you swap any two electrons, you always get the same wave functions. This is mainly just an observational fact, but there are theoretical reasons also. This exchange symmetry turns out to completely change the way that atoms work. It's not just a philosophical point, it's very measurable. Next, let's discuss spin. Spin is an important part of quantum mechanics. The basic idea is simple enough. The electron can be spin up or spin down. Here's a one-dimensional arena, and we put just one electron in on the left, and we let it travel to the right. We have, we've shown here an a magnetic field in green, and the magnetic field just rotates the spin. It switches the electron probability from up to down, and down from up to up. 
An endless source of difficulty for learners is what this spin is. Let's go over a few properties of it. Firstly, it is a genuine direction. If we turn the laboratory upside down, all of the spin up electrons would be spin down. If you turn the laboratory on its side, the spin up electrons will become half spin up and half spin down. Secondly, it is a rotation of some sort. If you persuaded all of the electrons in a, in a satellite to align up, the satellite would start rotating in the opposite direction to balance it out. Thirdly, there's nothing special about up-down. We could have equally chosen the x-axis and talked about spin left electrons versus spin right electrons. The electron, I'm not sure you can say it's literally spinning, but it does work the same as if it really was spinning. The up here would refer to the direction of the axis of rotation. So up equals anti-clockwise as you look from above. All this is a step up in complexity, but the minimum that you need to understand about spin is that every electron can be either spin up or spin down. 14. Here's a two-dimensional spin example. This takes us to the next part of, the, of this video, the one-dimensional helium atom. Let's just look at a classical one-dimensional helium atom here. The electrons have to move along a wire stretching from left to right, as we saw before, and repel each other. But this time, we're going to add in a central helium nucleus. Let's try plotting the position of the first electron on the, the x-axis and the position of the second electron on the y-axis as before, because we'll have to do the same when we show the quantum mechanics version. Helium atoms, two electrons, have four possible spin states. It has two electrons, each can be up or down, so together they have up-up, down-up, up-down, and down-down. These are represented by four separate panels. Each spin state can have any combination of positions of the electron, so each one of these spin states gets its own panel here. The equation of motion for this system is just our familiar Schrodinger equation, and we can set it in motion like this. Simple, really. We have an equation that tells us how the probability wave behaves, and that's it. So far, we've only discussed electrons, but protons, and arguably everything in the world, works the same way. There's nothing special about electrons. Let's consider the one-dimensional H2 plus molecule. This consists of two protons and one electron. The two protons would normally repel each other, but in this case they're both attracted to the same electron, and this keeps them bound together. First, let's look at the classical version of this. The two protons are moving relatively slowly, and there's a fast electron zipping around between them. We can do the same trick that we did before, and we'd um, split these into two different axes. So we have the separation of the protons, the distance between one proton and another proton, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we're going to put the position of the electron compared to the centre of mass of the two protons. When we're going to do this in, uh, in quantum mechanics, what we need to consider is how many variables we have. We have the position of the electron relative to the centre of mass of the molecule, and we have the distance apart of the two protons, so really just two variables. And so we have a two-dimensional space, a two-dimensional simulation. And it looks like this. That's the end of the video. I've summarised all the parts of the core theory that relate to atoms and molecules. There's a lot more complexity in quantum mechanics than this. There's light, there's photons, there's the way that electrons and positrons can be created. There's relativity, and these things can make quantum mechanics a lot more complicated than what I presented here. However, at its heart, it's still basically this idea. And often, undergraduate atomic physics will only really teach the basics that I've talked about in this video. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe. I don't post very often, and most posts should have lots of simulations like these.